Uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, how uh, miraculous the, the birth of the King. How wonderful and glorious, but Lord, may we also see your undying love for us, that you would give your one and only, born of the Virgin Mary, to be our Savior, the one who would save us from all of our sins. So, Father, we come before you right now, and we give you thanks for what you have done, what you have accomplished. We give you thanks and praise for your mighty word. And, Lord, as you speak in your word this morning, we just pray that whether we're here in this room or at home, that we would be listening. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you would give to us peace in these times, that you would give us courage uh, for the days ahead. Lord, you are great. You are awesome. Uh, we, we honor and glorify you, Lord, and you alone. And, Lord, all this we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing in our sermon series, Peace is Possible, by looking at a very courageous and obedient man named Joseph. So now you may be wondering, well, why did we just sing a song about Mary when this sermon is about Joseph? Well, it's simple. There are no songs about Joseph. Although I preached last night, and sure enough, somebody found a song about Joseph and emailed it to me, but I've never uh, heard it before. There just aren't any songs. In fact, if there was a song, it would simply be this, Joseph, did you know that there would be no carols about you? Uh, he was a very obedient, he was a very uh, courageous man. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 1, 18 to 25, encourage you to follow along in your Bible. Uh, words will be up on the screen whether you're here at home. Matthew chapter 1, 18 to 25. But before we get uh, to those verses, could I just share with you something concerning this man named Joseph? So, our family, uh, we made our annual uh, Thanksgiving trip to go out and find the perfect uh, Christmas tree. Do that every year on Thanksgiving Friday. Look for that perfect tree, and we found it. But it was enormous. You know, thankfully, we have a vaulted ceiling, and, but we picked this incredibly large tree, and my son and I, we carried it into the house no problem because, of course, they're wrapped in twine. So we got it in the house, and, and then we had to lift it up uh, into its stand, and that's when disaster struck. So in our living room, we got a table. On the table, there's a manger scene. And each of the, the characters in the manger scene, they're porcelain figures about this high. And it was my fault. I had the, the top of the tree, and, and I kind of swung it around to lift it up into the stand. And as I did, I knocked one of the figures right off the table. And it was poor Joseph. We looked and um, knocked his head right off. And my first inclination uh, was to eliminate him from the manger scene. I mean, if somebody asked, where's Joseph? I would just say, I don't know. He went to the Bethlehem CVS to buy diapers for the baby or something like that. But then my son, he saved the day, okay? A little bit of crazy glue, and he put Joseph's head back on Joseph's shoulders. But we still had fun with it. And we started saying things like, wow, Joseph, he was head over heels over Mary. <laughs> or, uh, Joseph, he lost his head when the baby was born. Or probably my, my favorite was, Joseph was a good man. He had a good head on his shoulders, you know. <laughs> and he was a good man. And, and so this is what it says in, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, Jewish marriage involves three different parts, three different steps. Step one, we'll call the engagement. With the engagement, quite often it was the groom's father who would look for a bride for his son. And so it was a 
prearranged marriage, which I believe, because I have two daughters, is a splendid idea. So that was step number one, prearranged marriage. It was called the engagement, which led to step number two, quite often called the betrothal. And in the betrothal, there was a special ceremony. Uh, there, there were uh, solemn promises that were shared in front of witnesses, similar to our modern-day marriage vows. And folks, at this point, the man and the woman, step number two, they would be considered husband and wife, even though they didn't stay in the same house. I mean, if you go to the very next verse, Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, Joseph is spoken of as Mary's husband. So at this point, they were husband and, and, and wife, and they hadn't come together, yet there were no sexual relations, but that was their identity. No longer just Joseph and Mary, but they were husband and wife. Now, the final step was the, the marriage. And uh, it simply, there was no religious ceremony. It simply involved the groom going over to the bride's house and then bringing her back to the house that he had prepared for them. And uh, there was no religious ceremony, but it was a festive occasion. There would have been a procession. And quite often, there was a party that lasted for days. So the reason I share that with you, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, we are in between steps 2 and 3. Joseph and, and Mary are pledged to be married to one another. Step 2, that's the betrothal but they haven't come together yet. The festive celebration hasn't happened yet. Joseph hasn't brought Mary back to his house, would have been step three. And in between steps two and three, here's the tough news that Joseph heard. Before that day came, Mary was found to be pregnant. And the Bible says, through the Holy Spirit. And that that, that statement takes us back to Luke chapter 1, right? Where the angel appears to Mary and says that she will give birth to a son. And all this would happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Luke tells us that Mary leaves her hometown and she travels south to a place called Judah to spend time with her relative by the name of Elizabeth. But before she leaves, she must have told Joseph that she was with child without telling him about the miraculous conception. Or if she did, at this point, Joseph didn't buy it. Which leads us to the next verse, Matthew 1, verse 19. It says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, it says that he was faithful to the law. Other versions will say because Joseph was a righteous man. By the way, it's the same comment that is made of uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 6. And this righteousness was not only in regards to Joseph's conduct, but it spoke about his heart as well. So the question is, when he found out that his betrothed, his wife is with child, what would this righteous man do? Well, I really believe at this point, when he finds this out, Joseph found it difficult to consider bringing Mary to his house to consummate the marriage. But then it also says that he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. And I believe that, that Joseph truly loved her. And, and what does that mean, to expose her to public disgrace? It would, would have meant that Joseph would, would have charged her with adultery. And, and we get the impression that this, at this point in history that, that the divorce laws were rather lax. They, they didn't take them seriously. In fact, a, a man could divorce his wife for any old reason. And, and, and Jesus, when he came to this earth, uh, he, he would uh, address this. He, he would speak to this. But according to the law, 
in Deuteronomy chapter 22, if someone was charged with adultery, if Mary was charged with adultery, she would be put to death by stoning. And, and, and so the Bible says he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. So here you got this guy. He is faithful to the law. In, in his heart, he knew what was right. He had no relations with her, and he knew that she was pregnant. And the Bible says he would divorce her quietly. Okay. Out of love. But he still must have been disturbed. Uh, folks, at this point in his life, I believe that you could rightfully say that, that Joseph had no peace. I mean, his life, his plans, his, his heart were all turned upside down, and how his heart must have ached. And so let me ask you, have you ever been there before? You, you, you looked so forward to something happening, and, and, and yet the news came, and it shattered your today, and it clouded all of your tomorrows. At least that's the way it seemed. And I couldn't help but think of all those couples, you remember back in 2019, who were planning on getting married in that great year, 2020. What a year to get married. And I was thinking about those couples, how those dreams were shattered. I was thinking about all of those moms and dads, you know, back in the springtime. Back in the springtime, what were we saying? Can't wait for the family to get together at Thanksgiving. And now Christmas is just around the corner. For a lot of people, because of what is happening in our world, there is disturbance inside, and we wonder, is peace possible? Just think of poor Joseph. It wasn't a Roman army or a, a war that changed his plans and crushed his dreams. It wasn't a, a virus that raged through the little town of Nazareth. No, there was this great moral issue and, and, and now it's impact on a man who I believe loved Mary, but he also loved and he honored the Lord God Almighty. And so this decision that Joseph made, it wasn't made with the flip of a coin. It wasn't made with the spinning of a wheel or the pulling of petals from a flower. I have to believe that it was gut-wrenching. When, when, when Joseph came to the conclusion and may have said to himself, okay, I'll divorce her quietly. But then God shows up. He always does. Verse 20, it says, But after he had considered this, divorcing her quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. An angel showed up. At, the, at Christmas, that first Christmas, um, heaven approached earth, and, and angels came close. And, and that veil that so often hid their presence was pierced now and again. And all of a sudden, there's an angel with this news. But don't be mistaken. Angels always did God's bidding. And, and so it wasn't necessarily a message from the angels it was a message from God himself that rocked Joseph's world. Now, we've heard this before. We've heard this story before, right? Christmas. Mary gets an angel. Joseph gets an angel. The shepherds get a bunch of angels. The news is shared. Joseph, don't be afraid. What is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. But can you imagine hearing that for the very first time? You gotta remember, Joseph, he hadn't attended any Christmas Eve services yet. J Joseph didn't have a manger scene on his table in his living room. You could point to it and say, There I am. He didn't have that. He didn't send out Christmas cards with manger scenes on the front, and he hadn't consumed any eggnog yet. Can you imagine hearing this? What would you make of it? She's pregnant. It wasn't me. It wasn't some other guy. Oh, yeah, it was the Holy Spirit. It happens all the time. Can you imagine hearing that for the first time? 
And yet, I want you to just consider this. Joseph may already have heard about this. He should have heard about this. As a little boy growing up, a Jewish boy going to the synagogue, he could have gone to the synagogue one day and they opened the scroll of Isaiah and they went to Isaiah chapter 7. He would have heard about this because Isaiah 7 verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. So, if you go back to the Gospel of Matthew, when the angel continues speaking to, to Joseph, reference is made to this passage in Isaiah. Matthew 1, it says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So consider this, as a nation and as an individual, okay, you're Jewish, you've been waiting you, you've been anticipating. You, you've heard all of God's promises again and again, and you've been waiting year after year after year for the Messiah to come. And that was true of Joseph, a righteous man. And now an angel tells you that your wife is going to give birth to a son. So, so when Joseph heard those words from the angel, she will give birth to a son, Shouldn't his mind and his heart race back to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive. I mean, didn't Joseph think, wait a second. Again, I, I know I'm not the dad. As far as I know, there is no other dad. The angel said that what was conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Wait, that makes her a virgin. Could she be the one? Could, could the son inside of her be the one, the Messiah? And the angel continues, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I love that. It made it easy for Mary and Joseph, right? They could put all the baby name books away. The angel said, hey, whether you want to or not, like it or not, you're going to call him Jesus. Jesus means one who saves. Why did God insist that the child be called Jesus? Because that's what he would do. That's why he came, to save his people from their sins. And then Matthew writes in verses 22 and 23, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, Matthew is the bridge, right, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Matthew includes more Old Testament passages than any of the other Gospels. Matthew was primarily written to the Jewish nation, and the significance of this passage for the Jewish nation and for Joseph was the realization that God finally had kept his promise and that Jesus is the Messiah. And then two more verses, 24 and 25. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So one more time, let's just go through those steps of marriage and then try to understand the emotions that, that Joseph may have experienced. So again, step number one, is the engagement. It, it could have been moms and dads who did all the arranging, and th there would have been that awkward moment, uh, Joseph, meet Mary, Mary, meet Joseph. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, there are two young kids going down the marriage road. And I, I was trying to think, what's the emotion at this point? I mean, you barely know her. Mom and dad had set it up. And I just came up with one word, yikes. Okay, that's probably the emotion of Mary and Joseph. Yikes, we're... We're going down the marriage road. And then step number two was the betrothal. Vows are shared. Promises are made. Uh, even though they didn't live together, they were still husband and, and wife. And you get the sense that Joseph truly loved Mary. And so what's the emotion at this point? Probably gladness. I'm thinking that Joseph was doing a happy dance. And then before you get to step number three, 
you find out that the one who is your wife, that she's pregnant. So what would be the emotion now? You go from yikes to gladness to what, anger, confusion, a sadness, maybe a bit of all three. But suffice it to say, there was no peace in the man's heart. And then suddenly we're told in verse 24 that Joseph woke up and he did what the angel said. He took Mary home to be his wife. And, and that's the third step of Jewish marriage. So, so you go, okay, what, what happened there? He goes from yikes to gladness to anger confusion, sadness, and all of a sudden an angel speaks to him and he takes Mary home to be his wife, step number three, and, and suddenly it seems as if his turbulent heart is filled with peace and he does what God tells him to do. What happened? Now, suddenly Joseph found the courage to make a change to his plans and instead of divorcing her quietly, they truly become husband and wife. Well, I'll tell you what happened. Joseph didn't suddenly find courage. No, God found him in his moment of despair, and God made him courageous. All through the scriptures, God would do that again and again. In the Old Testament, there was a man named Gideon. Gideon, with 300 men, had to go up against the entire Midianite army and by the way, it was God who whittled down his army to only 300. And you, you go, why would God do that? Judges 7 verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. God was just saying, no, no, Gideon, this battle, it's not going to be your battle. It's going to be my battle. This victory is not going to be your victory. It's going to be my victory. And suddenly God shows up, this timid, fear-filled man named Gideon, and God gives him courage to go with 300 men and defeat the Median army. One day God met a shepherd boy named David who faced wild animals while he took care of the flock. One day God met a young man by the name of Daniel who was thrown into the lion's den. One day, God met three young men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were thrown into a fiery furnace. One day, he met a young girl named Mary, and he made her and he made them courageous. You see, Joseph's brave self didn't suddenly show up. No, God showed up. God powerfully spoke to Joseph, and in the midst of a turbulent situation, God gave him peace, and then God gave him the courage to change the plan. A lot of people know this prayer. It's called the serenity prayer, and it begins this way. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can. You know, when I uh, read that, when I hear that, it, it's the simple acknowledgement that God, he is the power greater than me. And so wherever you find yourself today, what, whatever situation is confronting you today, I just want you to know that your God, he is big enough, he is strong enough, he is loving enough to give you the courage to face that situation and then the peace to make your way through it. You, you see, there may be a disturbance out there right now. But right now, it may be inside here. It may be inside your heart. There, there may be a, a situation right now, you're looking at it, and it seems to be beyond your control. And so the question is, what do you do? What can you do? First, humble yourself. And that doesn't mean that you beat yourself up. No, it's the simple acknowledgement that today, 
you've come to a point where you recognize that you are not the little engine that could. But rather, you have come to a point where you acknowledge that you are the little engine that can't do it on your own. That's what it means to humble yourself. It's a difficult word for us to say, two words for us to say, right? I can't. I can't do it on my own. Humble yourself. Number two, surrender. Surrender to the one who sent his one and only son into the turbulence of life and living to be our Savior. Surrender to the one who went to a hill called Calvary to die for the forgiveness of our sins. Okay, surrender to the one who defeated the grave, who stepped out of the tomb, giving us that same hope. It is simply saying, Lord, I can't, but I surrender to you because I recognize you can. And then third, trust him. Trust him. That, that as he did it in the Old Testament, New Testament, he'll do it today. He'll give courage to face the situation. He'll give peace as we make our way through it. Just trust him. And folks, this isn't a one-day deal. It's not a one-prayer deal. It's ongoing. And then finally, live confidently, surrounded by his peace. Live confidently. I find the Christian life to be uh, rather intriguing, interesting, isn't it? Um, because there is a point where you have to come to, where you have to say, I can't. Humble yourself. And then you surrender and you say, but he can. But then as he works in your heart and your life, then you say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Humble yourself. Surrender. Trust him. Live confidently in and through the turbulent times, knowing that you are loved by Jesus. In his mighty name, let's bow our heads to pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you now and we just thank you and praise you for what you have done, for what you uh, have accomplished in, in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, uh, we uh, thank you for this incredible, incredible account of a man named Joseph, so obedient, so courageous. And, and Lord, um, it's not just Joseph that uh, we, we uh, Lord, regard today, but more so you. And, and for your intervention into his heart and his life, and, and for how you spoke to him powerfully through an angel, that, that suddenly he would change the plan and would take Mary home to be his wife. And, and Lord, we just stand in awe of you and what you're able to do. How, Lord, you are able to give us peace in the midst of the storm and make us courageous, Lord, to face it. And, and Lord, we recognize that you did that for Gideon and for David and for Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Mary. And you, you did it for so many in the scriptures. And just remind us, that you continue to work, you continue to meet us uh, right where we're at. And so, Father, uh, Lord, we just thank you and, and, and we praise you. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring us to a point where we would humble ourselves. And you know us, Lord. You know that we struggle with that because we want to do it. We, we constantly believe that we can, but, Lord, that we would just come to that point, whatever the situation is before us, that we would say, Lord, I can't. And then we would turn our eyes to you, surrender to you, and then say, Lord, you can. And then we would just trust you in that situation so that we could live confidently, so that we could say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, Father, um, right now, uh, turn our eyes to your Son, Jesus. Turn our hearts, Lord, to you. O oh, Holy Spirit, work a mighty work in this place and beyond uh, that we would, uh, Lord, wholly surrender to you. And Lord, all this we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.